Welcome, Professor Gabriel, and uh, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, so, how should we begin? Well, a good way to begin is with the beginning. That's something we can learn from the history of philosophy, paradoxically, by looking into it. So philosophy has begun with the beginning, so why not begin with the beginning? And how does one do that then? Well, the best way is that something we can learn from Hegel, that to begin with the beginning is to understand what beginning means. And I suggest that we begin with the insight that to begin something is to begin something new. Otherwise, you wouldn't be beginning anything. You would be repeating from the start. So we should begin with the uh, insight that something new should happen, something which has never happened. And what would be, uh, let's say, Hegel's own problem with the beginning? I mean, is in a way maybe even paradigmatic from the how do you perceive Hegel's uh, philosophy as such? Is there sort of a a unified theory that is there already, or does is there a problem about beginning uh, in Hegel himself? Yeah. yeah, it's interesting if you look into Hegel's text. I mean, we all are used to thinking that uh, Hegel's philosophy is some version of totalitarian thought. So there's this closed system which tells us everything. It begins with the beginning and it ends maybe with God. So that's some perception that people have of Hegel. And then he's the enemy of open society as he has been declared. So why is this not the case? Because when people present Hegel in this fashion, I always ask them, so where is Hegel's system? Is it the phenomenology of spirit? Is it the science of logic? Is it the encyclopedia? the philosophy of right or early Hegel. So, and if you ask this question, you will see that there are many Hegels. There's no such thing as Hegel's system. There are various systems, various beginnings. And I do think that Hegel was aware of this. So Hegel purposefully uh, constructed his system in such a way that there are many systems, there are many systems, many beginnings. Uh, and a funny side story about Hegel is that he once began a lecture uh, with on the other hand. Mm -hmm. uh, so he was very uh, aware of the fact that every beginning has a presupposition. And this is what his whole philosophy is about. When you begin, you begin anew, but still that has a presupposition. Yes, yeah, so there's this um, whole idea, I guess. Perhaps this is a general theme in German idealism as a whole, that the beginning is not at the beginning, or something always eludes every beginning. You cannot just begin, or mm -hmm. how how would one do that? Exactly, yeah. So the beginning uh, has only happened after the fact, in a sense. So here's, here's uh, uh, an intuitive understanding of, uh, of what that might mean. So look, if you begin something, the beginning is only the beginning after something has happened. The beginning is something which will have been the beginning. So the beginning of a love affair, say, is only the beginning of a love affair if there's a love affair. Otherwise, it will have been the beginning, say, of a failed date <laughs> or a missed encounter. <laughs> so in order for the beginning of a love affair to be the beginning of that love affair, a love affair has to develop and to unfold. So the beginning always only becomes the beginning after that which has begun is realized. So paradoxically, beginnings come after the result. Yes, yeah, so one way of, of reacting to that would then be to say, well, there really is no beginning. So, okay, we try to begin and, and then you say, well, there's only the beginning in retrospect. So, so the, the beginning as such, we try to grasp it and it disappears. We, we try to begin and we do something, we start the love affair, and then we're in the middle of a love affair. We're no longer at the beginning. So, so what's there's there's something very enigmatic about this. Yeah, but the funny thing is, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you're perfectly right. The funny thing about this is that we're uncovering beginnings all the time. So human beings, what they do in their lives, but not just in their lives, also in science in general, is that we are uncovering beginnings. We are archaeologists by nature, in the original sense, where arche just means a beginning. So mm -hmm. we're interested in beginnings. We're be uh, interested in the beginning of our conscious lives. We're interested in the beginning of humanity as a whole, as, say, the Described by evolutionary biology. We're interested in the beginning of the universe and every single one of us is constantly interested in the beginning, say, of their day, in the beginning of this lunch, in the beginning of their date. So the beginning is something that we uncover after the fact. It's not that it then disappears forever or has never happened, but once it has happened after the fact, it's as real as anything else. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. but it only becomes itself it only becomes real but that opens for a little bit of anxiety then doesn't it i mean when you start out by saying that you only really begin when you begin something new and then on the other hand we don't know that we're beginning until after the fact so how do i know that i'm about to begin actually i mean how do i start something new how can i even sort of approach this problem of beginning i mean beginning for instance writing something mm -hmm. that is new yeah. or original or beginning uh, a new way of seeing society or understanding myself yeah. or changing myself finally beginning again how can mm -hmm. i even approach this if i can only establish yeah. it after the fact yeah. yeah yeah the interesting way is that if you realize this let's just call it retroactivity so you know like a, a causality which runs backward it's not physical causality of course but it's a causality which runs backward for example that's the structure of memory i mean what you remember to have been is also part is always part of the uh, network of uh, uh, current interests and future plans and that is what your memory is the uh, memory is uh, is always part of what you make of it so your own past be becomes your own past uh, after the fact and that in a certain sense is also relieves you from uh, anxiety but why because you never have to make an absolute beginning so you're, you're always in the middle of something and then a new beginning starts you're, ne you're never confronted with the nothingness of a naked beginning Uh, so the, the 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 of course we are born and that is in the most literal sense a naked beginning as uh, augustine says in in the middle of shit we are born uh, inter fecis et urines so in shit and piss we are born that is just a quote and uh, 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 if you know you know there's this movie the perfume the german movie uh, and also by uh, directed by tom tikva and uh, 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 that's well done you know the protagonist is born in shit And this is where we begin. But uh, uh, but this beginning is so radical that we are not yet there, which is why we don't remember it. Why don't we have memory of our birth? Because it wasn't the beginning. That's funny enough. Our birth only becomes a beginning after the fact. And the same happens with all beginnings. So the anxiety would only be fully realized if we if beginning would be a beginning without consequences. So the retroactivity kind of gives us freedom, paradoxically. But yet you are yourself, as we know, uh, very much concerned about how, for instance, to begin a book, and and you have some some kind of, uh, excuse me, but a small obsession about the first lines and words yeah. in a book. Yeah. Why is that a problem then? If if I mean, uh, it's not an absolute beginning in any case. Yeah, precisely because of that. I mean, if you sit, if you start writing a book, and you think, what would be the best first word? Then you will not find it. So you have to write the book blind to its own beginning, even though you know that you're beginning, but you have to let the beginning happen. And while you're developing the book, it will turn out that that beginning was the beginning of what you're doing. I think the same happened with the German idealists. Uh, they uh, they wrote very carefully redacted text in that sense. For example, the first word of Hegel's encyclopedia, uh, uh, the the main body of the text is philosophy. So the book begins with philosophy. And uh, once you understand the book, and the better you understand it, the better you understand that it's a book just about philosophy, uh, which is why it's called the Encyclopedia of the Philosophical Sciences. So it's Uh, it's a book about philosophy. And Hegel only realized this. So the beginning is often, like in psychoanalysis, something uh, of the status of the unconscious. So uh, uh, being obsessed with the beginning of the book does not put you in the position of anxiety. You just start writing. But while you're writing, you will realize that this beginning was the beginning of this book. And that's also often uh, uh, evidence for a good book. If you look into the history of literature and in film, it's uh, also very evident, you know, like many movies, in particular David Lynch movies, begin with, say, accidents. Uh, so the uh, 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 Mulholland Drive, I'm thinking about that in particular. So uh, the the beginning, it's not that you need to create the beginning, and uh, but the beginning does the business by itself in a, in a sense. So I think uh, Hemingway once mm -hmm. said that all you need is one true yeah. sentence and then you've got the entire book mm -hmm. in a sense. So 
in your mind, this is simply wrong, or is there some other way of understanding what Hel yeah. Hemingway said that somehow fits with with the point yeah, you're making? Yeah, yeah I think it's uh, it's it's partially wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, like you need this one sentence, but then the question is, what kind of consequences you draw from it? So Wittgenstein has this beautiful opening line of his Tractatus Logical Philosophicals, where he says, "The world is everything which is the case," and it turns out that the book is a book about the world, and more particularly, it's a book about the creation of the world. It has seven propositions uh, which correspond to the seven days of creation and the first sentence the first proposition is the creation of the world the world is everything which is the case and then the seventh pro uh, proposition the shabbat god stops doing anything and is quiet mm -hmm. uh, so that's the structure of the book but now imagine the book has started uh, the world is everything which is the case and the second sentence would have been i don't like i don't like to eat rabbits <laughs> 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 so it would st uh, it would not have been a great opening line then <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 uh. Mm. So uh, you, you, you gotta have the good beginning, but then also draw the right consequences from them. Mm. So how did it all begin? I do think that ultimately um, uh, I have arguments in my own philosophy to the effect that there's no such thing as all. Totality doesn't exist. I do firmly believe that the world does not exist. Uh, it's it's not as crazy as it sounds, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, 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 so I do believe that uh, uh, it did not all begin because there's no all. There are always only intermediate beginnings. And I do believe that there have always, always been infinitely many beginnings at the same time and that's currently also happening uh, even on the level uh, even on a physical scale i do think that right now infinitely many universes are uh, popping up out of nothing but i mean in any sort of decent mythology uh, whether it would be sort of ancient yeah. uh, mythology or contemporary yeah. science you will always have some kind of explanation mm -hmm. of how it all started. Yeah. And you could call it yeah. Big Bang Theory yeah. or whatever, but yeah. you will always have something searching for that moment yeah. when something that wasn't, or not something that wasn't, but the the nothing that was before yeah. turned into something that yeah. existed. Yeah, there yeah. is this fetishism of the yeah. beginning. Yeah. We want to know exactly yeah. the thing. Yeah the time, the yeah. place, what happened and yeah. how did it. Yeah. If you look at that, uh, I have a, 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 a story about this. Let's take a look at two beginnings. Uh, one is one of my favorite, uh, most favorite stories, uh, the beginning of the Bible. And the second is the beginning of Homer, uh, of Hesiod's uh, Theogony. Those are two very famous beginnings and, as people say, creation stories, if they are. So the Bible begins with Bereshit bara. Uh, so in the beginning, uh, uh, God created, bara means created, or so it's translated, whatever it really means, it's it's a good object of the a big debate. But okay, so it, the book begins with the beginning, in the beginning, that's the first word. And how does it signal, how does it mark the beginning? Well, by beginning with the second letter of the uh, alphabet, with, ale, uh, with bet. Uh, so it does not begin with aleph, which is a symbol for God, but it begins with bet, and bet is the beginning. So God, the beginning, the beginning is left out. So the book, funny enough, begins with the beginning by not beginning with the beginning, because God would have been the beginning. The, be the book begins after the beginning. Uh, uh, and uh, and the same holds for um, uh, the theogony. There, there's this famous story. Sometimes people th say something like this. Well, uh, Hesiod, uh, the great Greek mythologist, said uh, in the beginning there was chaos. And then chaos was divided into heaven and earth. That's something people learn. But he does not say in the beginning there was chaos. He says in the beginning chaos became brought on men... Uh, Chaos genet, he says, it became, which uh, uh, chaos becomes. Mm. And uh, uh, um, uh, some Greek philosophers have noted this, uh, uh, and, uh, th 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 which means that chaos is not even the beginning. There's always something before the beginning. And I do think that if you look, really look at the mythological texts, be they from the Chinese, Indian, or Greek, or, uh, 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 you know, like biblical tradition, there's something before the beginning. Uh, so this fetish, fetishism of the beginnings, as you beautifully called it, is suspended mm -hmm. by the, the, the very text to which we attribute this fetishism. There's actually, in, the, in Nordic uh, tradition, there's a very nice myth in yeah. the same I think fits your description very much where it, it says that uh, in the beginning there was nothing yeah and the north and south of 
south of nothing there was big areas with fire and ice yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> great <laughs> that's exactly what i mean yeah. that's exactly so i think that the mm. the mythological texts you know all those what we now think are creation stories mm. aren't creation stories they are ironically playing with the fetishism of beginnings that's why you don't get an answer yeah, yeah. but text then uh, modern cosmology yeah. like big bang theory yeah. isn't that really somebody who mm -hmm. really literally believed yeah. that Uh, okay, there was a beginning. Yeah. There was some kind of ultimate maximum density yeah. and heat or whatever, yeah. and then everything exploded and you got the universe. Yeah. And before that, there was nothing. Yeah, yeah. Or at least before that, we don't know what there was. Yeah. That's, but still, I mean, most uh, uh, the most speculative and also most amazing contemporary physicists, uh, get a, a big group of physic physicists working at MIT right now, and if that's not a serious place, uh, then what is? Uh, so, like, serious theoretical physicists now believe that the very idea of a big bang, a big bang and an absolute beginning is false. There are very good reasons, uh, some from string theory and others um, uh, from uh, inflationary cosmology, some of them combine the two, whatever. But the idea now is much more that you need to take account of the inflation of the universe in the, uh, 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 which means a very fast process of blowing the whole thing up. Uh, if you want a metaphor that's sometimes used. So imagine there was a very small scale crazy thing going on, a quant what they call a quantum fluctuation. So like very little, you not fully decided particles or waves or whatever, you know, floating around on a, a very small scale. Imagine the situation. And now uh, this is like a, 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 a cube uh, with uh, the very many sides. Uh, and now uh, a, a, a dice action. Now you're rolling, uh, you're rolling the dice, and at some point uh, you will hit a six, and a six means that this thing is blown up way faster than with light speed, and while it's blowing up. Pfft, The little particles and uh, and fluctuations become stars and planets and nebulas. Uh, 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 that is a you know a very simple way of imagining what they mean by inflationary cosmology. And given that someone sometimes you know at some point you hit the six, uh, uh, it's most likely that the six is currently the, uh, uh, also uh, uh, hit in uh, in other uh, universes, as they put it. So the many people now are multiverse. Uh, mm. uh, uh, physicists and the multiverse hypothesis basically means that there is no absolute beginning. There may be infinitely many big bangs, and for me as a philosopher, it's it's hard to imagine that that is not true. Like Giordano Bruno already said, uh, that there are infinitely many universes, and I do believe that that's correct. There are infinitely many universes, and they're all blown up out of nothing all the time. Interesting. How did that start? <laughs> <laughs> well, it never started. It never started. It's been going on forever. Endlessly, it, this has been happening all the time in all sorts of directions. And I, uh, I, I think this can even be proven outside of physics as a general claim about what we call reality. So I do think that what physicists are there are describing there, if they're describing it, you know, roughly in this multiverse hypothesis, can be uh, made intelligible by philosophy. Uh, this is what I'm working on. I do think that it can be proven that uh, every object, you know, from a table to my own feelings, that every object has infinitely many facets. And uh, that is the object. Mm. Well, uh, thank you very much for joining us, uh, Professor Gabriel, and for your beginnings. Uh, we have to end, but uh, it was very nice of you to come here. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks for your hospitality. Thank you.